Hi, Grid 12s. I'm back again. My name is Tinigo Kosa, and I welcome you to a lesson in physical sciences. And today we will be looking at the knowledge area called chemical systems. And specifically, we will be talking about chemical industries in South Africa, of course. I think uh, that's uh, mainly most of the chemical systems we're going to talk about happen. Um, and of course, worldwide, because these are systems or chemical systems that actually are very much economically related. So worldwide, we've got systems like this happening. Just uh, stay with me for this one and 15 minutes, one hour, 15 minutes of lesson, and we will be learning a lot about what happens in industries. So like I said, it will be all about chemical industries. Now, what particular industries will, will we be looking at? We'll be looking at how the industries that manufacture fertilizers do it. We'll be checking their processes, see how these fertilizers are produced. We'll also be looking at how batteries are made because our life revolves around energy and this is one way of generating energy that we need in our everyday life. We will also look at an industry that looks at the production of chlorine and of course alkali substances. So we call it the chlor alkali industry. Okay, so those are the three that we will be looking at in this lesson. Now let's proceed and start talking about fertilizers and how they are produced in industries. Now first of all we need to know that we've got two types of, in, of fertilizers. Okay. There are two types. The first type of fertilizers is what we call organic fertilizers. And for these ones, we don't have to be producing them in industries, okay? These are derived from plants and animal remains. E.g., compost, you know when you've got grass, when you cut grass, you pile it together, you dig a hole, you put it inside there, cover it with, with uh, uh, soil, the grass is going to decay there, it's going to get rotten there, and then all the nutrients, plant nutrients that were there are going to feed the plants that are going to be grown in that area. Okay, or sometimes you just put it together even outside, not inside the ground, and uh, put it nicely, everything, sheaves, uh, 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 grass, you know, remains of your mealy, uh, plants and everything, put them together. You allow it to stay together for a long time. That becomes your compost and you can use it, okay, and as, as, as fertilizers. And we also use, of course, cow dung, okay, which we call manure, okay, the, 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 the things that come from animal excretion. We use that as manure, all right? And that will be one way of getting our fertilizer. So this, if you like, is the natural way of getting it, okay? But then we have what we call inorganic fertilizers. Inorganic meaning that they are not necessarily derived from living uh, plants and animals, but these ones, we actually manufacture them. So these are the manufactured fertilizers and we manufacture them through chemical processes, all right? And examples of such uh, uh, fertilizers could be things like ammonium sulfate, uh, magnesium phosphate, okay? Things like that will be what we call artificial fertilizers. And we will be concentrating mainly on these artificial fertilizers because these are the ones that are produced in industries. And let's see how industries then put together this or produce these fertilizers. And of course, like I said, this section of the work is very much linked to the economics of the day. An industry is producing these fertilizers, selling it to farmers so we get a food uh, reach in proteins and other things and they can grow in a short space of time and the whole nation is fed. But then we are also going to look at what other impacts, what environmental impacts do all this production of fertilizers have uh, 
in our daily life. So we, we're going to look at all those things. So those are inorganic fertilizers, example, ammonium sulfate, magnesium phosphate, like I said. Now let's move on and look at what causes or what drives industries to actually come up with these uh, artificial fertilizers. First of all, we know that our plants need nitrogen, okay, to grow healthy. So we need what we call plant nutrients. Part of that is nitrogen. We've got phosphorus. We also have potassium. Now, what is the, 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 the symbol that is used to represent the element nitrogen? It's N, okay? And phosphorus is P, and potassium is K. Now, this NPK, you must have seen it in some bags, okay, that are sold in hardwares, sold in, you know, uh, nurseries where they sell you plants and other things. They, some of them would have these bags of fertilizers that they can sell to you as well. Okay, so this NPK is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And of course, this NPK is also given to you in those bags in some ratio. Sometimes they will say 3 to 1 or 3 to 5, for example. This is just the ratio in which uh, these nutrients are uh, contained in that particular bag. Now, these NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, we call them primary nutrients. We call them primary nutrients. We also have secondary nutrients. What are those? It's calcium, magnesium, we also have sulfur as secondary. Now, calcium, Ca, magnesium, can you still remember? Mg, sulfur, S. Okay, so those are your secondary nutrients, secondary plant nutrients. Okay, now let's go to the process itself. Let's go to the processes in which fertilizers are produced in industries. Right. How are they manufactured? Firstly, we see that we need specific type of acids to produce these fertilizers. Specifically, we need nitric acid, we need sulfuric acid, we need phosphoric acid. These are essential or important in the manufacturing of artificial fertilizers, okay? And these acids are usually allowed to react with ammonia to produce these various types of fertilizers, okay? And because ammonia sort of becomes central to this, we will therefore need to look at how this ammonia is produced. And of course, with, the, with, some of the, with, with these two acids as well, we're going to look at how they are produced in industries as well. Okay, now let's look at how ammonia is produced in industries. Ammonia in industry is produced through a process called Heber, all right? So some scientists called Heber came up with a process that is used to produce ammonia in large quantities that is used in industries. So that process is called Heber process because obviously he's the founder of that particular process and it is named after him. Now, what happens here? Here we have nitrogen, okay? And we have hydrogen. The two are made to react together. So when they react together, they are going to give us the ammonia, but how does this happen? Nitrogen, you, we know it is from air, okay? And because it is from air, it is found from, we, 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 we actually extract it from air by using a process called uh, fractional distillation. So through fraction, frac fractional distillation, we are able to take or get nitrogen from the air. Now, perhaps you may be asking yourself, what is this fractional distillation? 
What actually happens here is that you liquefy air because nitrogen is in air. You liquefy it. When you liquefy it, you know all the components of air, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, okay, and all other gases. And you know their boiling points, okay? When you have liquefied it, you boil it in such a way that the only gas that can boil at that level, that boiling point will be nitrogen. So you get the boiling point of nitrogen. You boil it to that level and you know that the only gas that is boiling or getting out of there is nitrogen. Then you can collect it and the rest may not be able to be boiling at that point. They, in other words, there would be no uh, 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 moving, okay, change of phase from liquid to gas. The only one that is changing from liquid to gas at that moment will be nitrogen and therefore you can extract it. You can get it out of that uh, mixture of gases as pure nitrogen, pure nitrogen, and you can use it in this process here. Hydrogen can be synthesized, so you can get it as a synthetic gas, okay, or also the same method can be used. Now, when you mix them, when you allow them to react, they react in a reaction vessel into maybe about 400 degrees Celsius, Okay, you let them react there. When they react, they form ammonia gas. And then you can liquefy them, liquefy the ammonia, ammonia there. You can liquefy gaseous NH3 there. And when you liquefy it, it means here you will be collecting as liquid ammonia will be collecting this as liquid ammonia somewhere down there. So that is more or less, you know, in a very generic form, the process that is uh, uh, happening there in terms of the production of ammonia, the Herber process. Okay, now, what equation can tell us how the reaction occurred? In other words, what happens inside there? We have got nitrogen, remember? We've got hydrogen. Okay, and these are reacting. And if I remember well, this is a reversible reaction, okay, to give us ammonia. Okay, and uh, obviously this reaction here is not balanced, so we'll need to balance it here. And if we balance it here, you would see we need a two there to make sure that there are two nitrogens on the right, as we have two here. And then, but then by putting that two, we are having six hydrogens. So we'll need to come back and balance this one here by putting a three. So that is the chemical reaction that occurs there, formation of ammonia. Okay, and this ammonia formed as a gas, liquefied there, okay, and collected as a liquid there. In other words, you cool it off there. Some uh, cooling off process happens there for us to get it as a liquid at the end there. Okay, so this is basically or more or less what the Herber process is all about. Now, because we also said that the acids we mentioned up there are important for, 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 for the manufacturing of fertilizers, let's also look at some of the processes that are involved in the uh, formation of those or production of those acids. Okay, so here we have a process called Ostwald process, okay? The Ostwald process is a process used in the preparation of nitric acid. This is the industrial preparation of nitric acid. It involves four steps. The first step is, you see now ammonia is central. Ammonia is made to react with oxygen under intense pressure and we produce nitrous oxide, nitrogen monoxide with water, okay? Now these gas, nitrogen oxide, monoxide is the one that we need in our second step to produce nitrogen dioxide. And this is also a reversible reaction and therefore can reach equilibrium, okay, in the Ostwald process. Now, when we have the nitrogen dioxide, it is this nitrogen dioxide that can be allowed to dissolve in water. And when it dissolves in water, in step three, 
we have our nitric acid in solution. And look at how lovely this is. When you produce your nitric acid there, you still have your nitrogen monoxide such that you can take this back to step two and allow it to react with oxygen so you have got some uh, kind of circular process there, a cycle in which you always have what you started with, you can take it back and continue with the process to produce what you're looking for. Another way of getting straight to your nitric acid would be to uh, have your nitrogen, your, your ammonia, and then allow it to react with oxygen, but not necessarily in the same manner, and then you produce nitro, uh, nitric acid straight away and some water. But this, like I said, it's crucial because you need it to go to nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide dissolves in water to give you nitric acid. That is called Ostwald process. So that's how it happens in industries. Another acid that we need in the manufacturing of, of uh, fertilizers is what we call sulfuric acid. And this one is, pro is produced making use of a process called contact process. The contact process is a process that starts with sulfur. So we start with sulfur acid, uh, solid, we react it with oxygen, and we form sulfur dioxide. Okay? And with sulfur dioxide, here we allow it again to react with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. When sulfur trioxide is formed, and again here, hmm, this reaction here is reversible, all right? So it can reach equilibrium. Once you have your sulfur trioxide, you can then allow your sulfur trioxide to react with available sulfuric acid to give you concentrated sulfuric acid. And we call this the pyrite, okay, or pyravic, uh, sorry, the pyrite or the pyravic sulfuric acid. This is a highly concentrated sulfuric acid. And then you can allow that to react this concentrated sulfuric acid to be diluted or reacting with, with water to come to your sulfuric acid there in the form that we want it when we manufacture our fertilizers. So that is what is happening. Remember that in, steps, in step three, we can also okay, have this sulfur trioxide reacting with water, water straight away, and we have the sulfuric acid formed there. Okay, but it works quite well when we bring in the sulfuric acid that is there already. We make it react with sulfur trioxide and we produce this very important substance, pyravic sulfuric acid or the pyrite. And that then, the water comes down after the formation of the pyrite. You dissolve the pyrite in the water and you have your sulfuric acid. Okay, so... These two acids, the nitric acid and the sulfuric acid, are very important or very essential when it comes to the production of fertilizers and, of course, our inorganic fertilizers, as we're going to see in the next uh, uh, section of our lesson. Let's move on and let's now look at how these fertilizers are produced. Here, look, we need ammonia, we need an acid. In this case, it's ammonia and nitric acid. What are we producing? This is called ammonium nitrate, okay? So we have produced ammonium nitrate. Ammonium nitrate. This ammonium nitrate is our artificial fertilizer. What is the plants, or what are the plants, plants getting from this fertilizer? Obviously, look at that, nitrate. So there is nitrogen here. So plants are going to get the nitrogen there as one of the, uh, the, the nutrients. Okay, here, Look at it, we've got 
in our second part of the uh, second equation, we've got ammonia, we've got sulfuric acid. At the end, we've got ammonium sulfate. Now, this is ammonium sulfate. So that's one of, or that's one of our uh, fertilizers that has been formed there. Ammonium sulfate, let's check or let's look at it. Ammonium sulfate here, you would see that the plants will be getting the nitrogen and what else? Even the sulfur, okay, as a secondary nutrient, okay? So primary nutrient, secondary nutrient from the same artificial fertilizer, ammonium sulfate. Let's look at the third one. We've got ammonia, we've got uh, phosphoric acid, okay, H3PO4, right. Now, we have ammonium phosphate formed, okay, ammonium phosphate formed. Okay, so this is one other uh, type of fertilizer that are formed that can be produced in industry. Now, ammonium phosphate, you can see what is happening here. You have got nitrate, so you have, we have got nitrogen, so there is one essential uh, uh, plant nutrient, primary nutrient. We also have phosphorus there, okay? So we have those plant nutrients available in that particular uh, fertilizer. And we've got the primary ones, nitrogen, phosphorus, okay? But we can also have another situation where we're producing some uh, uh, fertilizer with potassium. We can have potassium salt uh, with acid, nitric acid, and we have potassium nitrate is a fertilizer with hydrochloric acid. And of course, even potassium chloride itself, it's a fertilizer because it has potassium. But then this one, simply you could have arrived at it by just uh, allowing that reaction to take place. Okay? K, K, C, L, K plus C, L giving you, so this is C, L, 2, sorry. We know that chlorine is a diatomic molecule and therefore we would have this as that when we, we, we balance it. Okay, so that will be your, your fertilizer, okay, with potassium, and potassium is one of your primary nutrients. Okay, now let's move on to look at what happens to the environment when we use this uh, fertilizers or this type of fertilizers. In other words, we're looking at the impact in the environment. And in your learning outcomes, okay, we know of learning outcome three that talks about science and the environment or science and the society. And this is where most of the questions in the exam would come from in terms of how you relate your science knowledge to the environment and how you use it, of course, to assist or to develop uh, the, 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 the people or develop humans on earth in the environment. What knowledge can you bring in scientifically that can be of help? Right, so let's look at the environmental impact of the use of these artificial fertilizers in our farms. There is something called eutrophication. And what is this? Now, this is a process where the nitrogen, okay, you would see that so many of the artificial fertilizers we spoke about contained nitrogen. Nitrogen inside the soil, it's, or the, 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 these fertilizers inside the soil are leached, okay? In other words, washed away, or washed away, okay? Is, these fertilizers are washed away from the soil and flowing into, flowing into rivers and dams, okay? Rivers and dams, 
okay, and even lakes, okay. So even in lakes, we find that. Now, when this happens, there is something that happens inside the, the, the river there or the dam or the lake. There, is, there are plants there called algae, okay. The algae is going or likes this nitrogen, okay, takes the nitrogen in and it begins to bloom. So we call that algae bloom, okay? It becomes, it grows rapidly, becomes big, strong there. And when it dies, okay, when, it, when, when this algae dies, what happens is that the nitrogen content depletes oxygen in there. So in other words, it reduces the oxygen level in that water. And because the oxygen level is depleted, what is going to happen? This leads to death of aquatic plants. Death of aquatic plants and animals. Okay, those plants and animals that live in water die. Okay, plants and animals. That leads to that. And this is called eutrophication due to the excessive presence of nitrogen in water. Okay. Now, another thing that happens is that you, you would remember that we, we, we're doing or we're manufacturing these fertilizers so that we can use them in plants and enrich them so that we can eat them as human beings and as animals as well. And that stays in our bloodstream. And what happens when they, this comes to our bloodstream? The nitrates rich water that is in there, when it comes into our bloodstream, into our bodies, again it reduces the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. And when that happens, we obviously we're not healthy. We need enough oxygen in our blood to be able to survive and live healthily. But this is going to reduce the oxygen capacity in the blood and we can understand what is going to happen there. Sicknesses, people die young. I mean, you, you, your life, the life expectancy is actually being lowered by this particular excess existence of nitrogen in our body. Okay, so these are some of the environmental impacts that we have in terms of nitrogen getting into our, into our, our rivers, lakes, and dams, okay, and also us eating uh, oxy, I mean nitrogen rich uh, food stuff that gets into our bodies. Okay, so this is where your LO3 comes in a lot, you know. This is science and society. Oh, okay, science and society, and of course, and the environment. Okay, so we're looking at the effect of science on the environment, on the people. So this is how, as scientists, we can contribute positively into human development. So these are the types of knowledge that we need to know every day. Okay, now let's move on and have a look at an example. Right, now example one, something that you can come across in your papers. Write down the chemical equations to show how the following artificial fertilizers are manufactured. Firstly, ammonium nitrate. Okay, so you've got a nitrate, you've got ammonia. Okay, that's how you should think about it. If I've got ammonia, I've got nitrate, it means from the acid side, I can think of nitric acid. So the nitrate leads me to be thinking of the nitric acid. Ammonium leads me to think of ammonia. So this is what I can uh, link together. So I'm seeing a reaction here between ammonia and nitric acid. So this is how then the ammonium nitrate is going to be formed. Ammonia plus nitric acid to give me ammonium nitrate. Now ammonium NH4, that is the ammonium I. Okay, nitrate NO3 minus so, well, it's going to be that, NH4NO3, 
okay? And this equation here is balanced as it is, okay? So there we go, H NH4, NO3, ammonium nitrate. Let's look at the next one. Ammonium phosphate, oh, this one, phosphate should be coming from phosphoric acid, so I'm thinking H3, P, O4, okay? So I'm thinking that. Ammonium, again, simple, I think, to think of, ammonia. So I would have NH3 plus H3, P O4, giving me ammonium. So it's NH4 plus, so that will be in brackets. If I look at this, mm, okay, so that will be a three, and this will be a four. Or I can have a two here and H there, which will be by phosphate, okay? So if I have NH4, 2, H, P, or 4, then I'll be having ammonium by phosphate. That is when I have that, okay? So that is, that is how the, the reaction or the chemical equation is like. Now let's look at the last one. I've got again ammonium sulfate. This one makes me to think of the sulfuric acid, so H2, SO4, this one simple and easy, ammonium. So I would have NH3 plus H2, SO4, sulfuric acid. What am I going to get? Ammonium, NH4, sulfate. There should be a 2 there because it's SO4, 2 minus there. Then the two there. So it's, that's ammonium sulfate. Okay. And uh, of course, you can balance this equation. We've got six hydrogen there. Let's check. And then you've got uh, five this side. Uh, you've got two nitrogens there. You've got one this side. So that is the starting point. You can put the two there, two, six hydrogen, eight hydrogens, eight hydrogens. Okay. And SO4, SO4. Then we find. Okay, by doing that, we have balanced that chemical equation. Right, so that is how you need to think about these things when you are manufacturing your fertilizers. If something is called potassium chloride, perhaps you can think, look, I've got potassium and chlorine. Maybe that will be a straight reaction, okay? Or you can need an acid to do that. You have got ammonium nitrate. Nitrate, nitric acid. Ammonia, ammonium should be from ammonia, so you will have NH3 plus the nitric acid to give you your ammonium nitrate. So that's how you should be thinking about it when you are to write down chemical equations there. Right, let's move on. And let's now look at example two. Okay, now example two, we're going to look at something that is usual, some question that is always there in the exam, the type of question that is always there. Write down one word, one term for the following statements. The process whereby decaying plant materials containing huge amounts of nitrogen leads to the death of aquatic animals such as fish, leads to some people here talk of dead zones, okay? zones where or places where the aquatic life is really dead. It's not the dead zones. What process is that? Oh, we have just spoken about that. It's called eutrophication. Okay, so that is the, the process there. The preparation or the industrial process used in the preparation of ammonia. We have just said it. What is that? It's called the Haber process. So these are some of the uh, statements you can expect on your one-word answer 
type of question. Your very first question in the question paper, question one, okay, in both uh, paper one and paper two, one word questions, have a process, okay? The industrial process used in the preparation of nitric acid, we call it the Ostwald process, right? Okay, so this is an area where one word questions can easily come from. And down here, we have got to say, what is this thing here? The highly concentrated sulfuric acid produced at the end of the contact process. Now, what is called, uh, what is this substance called? We call it oleum, okay? Highly, highly uh, concentrated sulfuric acid. We call it oleum, okay? Now, this is what forms at the end of the contact process. Remember the contact process? SO2 reacting with oxygen to give you sulfur trioxide. Now let's move on. We have spoken about fertilizers. Remember in, 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 in chemical systems, the industrial systems or industrial chemical reactions, we're talking about the manufacturing of fertilizers, we're talking about batteries, we're talking about the chloralkali industry. Now we've done the fertilizers, we're coming to batteries. Now, let's quickly look at that, and then later on, we will finish off the lesson by looking at the chloralkali industry. Now, battery, a battery is formed by a number of cells that are connected in series. That we should know. And in here, we'll be talking about primary cells and secondary cells. What is a primary cell? It's a cell that is not rechargeable, which means once you have used it, when it goes flat, it is finished, you just have to throw it away. But then as scientists, we need to teach people that not all these batteries can just be thrown away. Some of them, we need to get ways of recycling them because they are harmful to the environment. Okay, secondary cells, this is a cell that can be recharged. So you can keep this one longer. When it's flat, you, you, you put it on a charger, you charge it back. One example of that is a cell, it's a cell phone uh, battery. You charge it when it is finished, and then it picks up the energy again, and it lasts you for two, three uh, days, and it's flat again, you recharge it. But when it is, it can't be recharged anymore, uh, and it's, it's done, its life uh, span is gone, then it must be disposed, and there must be ways of disposing it. And I think as a country, that is one area that we need to look at in terms of disposing this type of uh, materials, batteries, cells that are harmful to our in environment. We need to learn how to do it. And we need to have companies that should come out and say, if your cell phone battery is done, please bring it back to us. We, we've got, we, we need to do something with it. We need to recycle it in some way. Okay, now, Let's move on. Let's start by talking about these primary cells. What is a primary cell? We have defined that. It's a cell that is not rechargeable, okay? Types of such cells are cells like the alkaline dry cell. And we refer to it as a dry cell because there is no visible liquid available that we can see. But inside this cell, it is moist, or there is moisture, um, moist uh, chemicals of ammonium chloride, zinc chloride, and manganese oxide, okay? And remember, from the uh, electrochemistry that we did, we know that a battery or a cell operates because there are process of, processes of oxidation and reduction taking place. So here, we have got the oxidation taking place here, and that oxidation happens to zinc. Zinc is oxidized from zinc to zinc 2 plus, okay? In the presence of an alkali there, and then uh, uh, those two electrons are there and pr are produced there, but then they are received by what? By the manganese oxide inside the most part of the cell, the moist part of the cell, and uh, some water level there that makes it moist 
and the electrons are received, and then we produce manganese trioxide. And of course, again, it's some high uh, alkali that is and hydroxide formed. Okay, so this is what is happening with the oxidation, and this will be reduction, if you like, and that is where the cathode is. So this side here is reduction, whilst the top side is oxidation. And of course, with reduction, that is where the cathode is, and here the oxidation, that's where your anode is. So the zinc uh, uh, metal that covers your, your, your cell, okay, is your oxidation uh, part, is your anode part. If you look at your battery, your, I mean your cell, the cells, the torch cells that you buy from uh, uh, shops, that covering there is made of zinc, and that zinc, that's where oxidation happens, is the anode of your cell. Okay. Now let's look at another one, mercury cell. Hey, mercury. Mm. Mercury. Hg. The oxidation there, again, it's your zinc, all right, and reduction happens with your mercury uh, oxide there in the presence of water, receives those electrons to become mercury. Now, mercury liquid, all right? This is a dangerous substance. We'll talk more about it. Now, mercury liquid. So this is continuously formed inside a mercury cell, all right? And when it is continuously formed, uh, we throw it away. It means we are throwing mercury into the environment. And like we can see at the bottom here, mercury is poisonous. It is also carcinogenic, and therefore it pollutes our environment. What is the meaning of this term? It means that mercury causes cancer. Okay, now this is a, a very bad uh, health condition, cancer, right? So many people die uh, from cancer. Now, let's, let's, let's look at it. You would see here that we've got the E naught for the oxidation or the anode, if you like. And we have the E naught for the cathode reduction section. So we can calculate for the E naught cell here uh, because we know that this is always E naught cathode minus E naught anode. Okay, we can do this. And what will this be? Where is the cathode? 0 0.098 plus the anode side. I've already wrote a, min a plus there. Perhaps let me just take it straight as it is. 0 0.098 minus minus. Look at that. That's minus 1.25. Okay, so this will mean that we've got 0 0.098 plus 1.25. So this equals to 1.348 volts. Okay, now that will be the, 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 the EMF of the cell. Right, so Normally, the cells, you would find them giving you 1.5 volts, such that when you have got four of them, then you've got uh, six volts, things like that, okay? So these are the mercury cells that we, we, we can use or we do use in our everyday life. But like I said, environmental impact of this, you would see that when you look at the net equation here, you've got zinc and uh, uh, mercury oxide reacting, what is produced is zinc oxide, which is not so harmful, in fact, not harmful to the environment, but look at that. Mercury is produced, and mercury, what I have said here, all these things. So environmentally, when we dispose these cells, when we throw them away, this is what we're doing to the environment. We are polluting it with this uh, poisonous substance. It kills animals, it kills uh, life out there, and apart from that, if we get into contact with it as people, as animals, then we can uh, have cancer and we can suffer from cancer and that is, that is not nice. 
Okay, so that's what we have there. Let's look at example three. Okay, example three. Here we've got a mercury cell. Okay, as an example of a secondary cell. The half reaction occurring in this cell are shown below. So we've got zinc uh, becoming zinc oxide there. So Zn2 plus. So there are electrons that are lost. So you would say that this is oxidation. Okay. So you'll say that this is oxidation. And then we have got this part here where uh, mercury oxide is reduced, okay, to mercury liquid, right? And this is the reduction, of course. Okay. So now, let's answer these questions. What is a secondary cell? This is a cell that is rechargeable. So we can recharge this cell and use it again. Okay? Now write down the overall cell reaction. Now let's see if we can do that. You see here overall cell reaction. If you remember well from the electrochemistry, we have electrons on the left and electrons on the right and we check if they are equal in size then we can cancel them out. Now let's look at it. We start from the left. The top equation where we've got our oxidation side you would see that we've got zinc solid plus look at the OHs. We've got 2 OH minus on the left 2 OH minus on the right, they can now cancel out, so we don't have them. So what will be next? We will write what is down here. So we have HGO as the solid. Do we have a plus here? Let's look at the water. The water on the left, H2O, H2O, left and right, so this H2O on the left be cancelled with H, that H2O on the right. So this is what we have only on the left. Okay, and we have our uh, arrow there. Okay, this on the side now. Remember, this is gone, and that is gone. So we are left from the top one, from the oxidation section, we are left with ZnO, okay, which is zinc oxide solid. Plus, what else is left at the bottom here? That is gone. What is left is mercury, Hg liquid. So this is the net equation. That's the overall cell reaction that is happening there. Why does the use of this cell pose an environment or environmental hazard? Why? Now look at that thing there. That is the reason. Okay? So you can see that we have got mercury forming or produced here. Uh, this cell, the cell produces mercury during operation or when it operates. Which is poisonous and causes cancer. Okay, so this will be the reason why the use of this cell poses an environmental hazard. Okay, nice example. Now, let's move on to secondary cells. Okay, we're still talking about cells that can be recharged. One example of that is the lead acid storage battery. And this is what we use in cars, motor vehicles. Okay? Now, what happens there? We've got the oxidation side. Lead in a solution of sulfur, uh, uh, of, 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 of a sulfate, which will be sulfuric acid, if you like forming the lead sulfate 
and two electrons are given off there. So that's your oxidation side, if you like. Okay? So that's oxidation. And this, of course, will be your anode in that battery or that cell. Right? Now, the second part is that of lead oxide in the presence of an acid, the sulfate ions, and obviously it's the sulfuric acid there, receiving the two electrons from up there, and then you're forming uh, lead sulfate water as well. Now, this is receiving of electrons, so we're talking reduction. And because this is where reduction takes place, we're talking cathode. So this electrode here will be the cathode electrode. Okay? Now, from here we can also, like previously, we can calculate for the E cell. Remember, E cell equals E cathode minus E anode. Okay? And that, the EMF for this one will be given by what is our cathode value here. The cathode it's positive 1.685 minus the anode minus 0 0.356. Now, this is going to be 1.685 plus 0 0.356. And what do we get as the answer here? 5 plus 6 is 11, carry 1, okay? And 8 plus 5 is 13 plus 1, 4, carry 1. And then 6 plus 3 is 9 plus 1, 10, carry 1. Then uh, 0 plus 1 is 1 plus the 1 that we carried over, that gives us 2. So this is 2.041 volts. Now, this is the EMF of one cell, one cell in that lead accumulator or lead acid storage battery for the car. Now, this battery, the car battery, consists of six cells. And because the cells are six, it means that the total, the total E cell, E battery, let me put it that way because the total EMF, which will be E battery, okay, which will be E battery. So it's six cells, so the total, which will be E battery, will be equal to six times the E cell. And what will that be? 6 times 2.041. That gives you 6, uh, 24, 4, carry 2. 6 times 0, it's 0 plus 2, it's 2. Then 6 times 2 is 12. So this will be 12,246 volts. And that is why you have your battery, your car battery, given the value of 12 volts or written 12 volts on it is to tell you that the total EMF, the, the E battery, will be 12 volts from this calculation here because we've got six cells. Each one of them is about two volts of EMF. Okay. Now, let's look at something very important again. Like I said, with this, we are very much linked to the environment, linked to it's economics, it's about money making, it's companies, it's producing fertilizers, producing batteries, and now impact on the environment. Okay, let's look at it. Recycling and pollution. Remember that these uh, lead uh, acid storage batteries are made up of plastic materials. Okay, now at the end, these plastic materials have to be broken up, remolded into new battery casings. Because if you don't do that, you will throw it into the uh, environment. And when you throw it into the environment, some of them, if not all of them, 
are not biodegradable. So, in other words, they cannot decay when you throw it out there and when they are on the soil, inside the soil, they still cannot decay. They cannot, they are not biodegradable. Okay, so the best way is to recycle them, is to remold them and make new battery casings through them so that we can reuse them instead of throwing them away because it's not going to help us uh, with, with the environment. The battery acid, remember we're talking the sulfuric acid there. It has to be neutralized before it is thrown away, before it is dumped into the environment because the acid obviously is going to kill the plants, the life, the, the insects, okay, and will have an effect even on animals as well. So we don't throw acids like that into the environment. Lead is also not a, a, a healthy substance, okay? So the lead grids are melted in smelting furnaces and remolded as well to be used again, okay? Because if you don't do that, you throw it into the uh, environment. Lead is poisonous. You can see that even the, 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 the petrol industry is moving away from the use of leaded, I mean, uh, petrol into unleaded petrol. We don't need the lead anymore because it's harmful to the environment. Okay, so it is very important that we recycle and minimize or not pollute at all, pollute the environment. Last part of this section or this lesson is the chlor alkali industry. Let's look at this. Here we're looking at how chlorine is produced and it is produced through a process of electrolysis. Okay, when something is extracted from a solution, taken out of that solution through the use of electrical energy. That is electrolysis, okay? So electrical energy is used here, and it's used to break a concentrated solution of sodium chloride, breaking that ionic substance into chlorine and sodium, and, and sodium ion and chloride ion. The chloride ion is taken out made to oxidize itself into chlorine gas. And this concentrated solution of uh, sodium chloride is called brine, okay? The products that are formed is chlorine gas, hydrogen gas, on sodium hydroxide, hence the chlor alkali industry because part of what is produced is also sodium hydroxide, okay? Now, this, again, is an oxidation reduction process. What happens in the oxidation process? We are oxidizing the chloride ions, the Cl minus ions, to chlorine gas, and then by making it to, to, to lose those electrons. And then there will be the cathode side or the reduction side, okay? Okay, so this will be reduction where the electrons are received. Water receives the electrons to give us hydrogen and the OH minus. Now you would remember that the Cl minus they are from the Na plus ions and obviously the Na plus ion and the OH minus ion are going to react together and give us the sodium hydroxide in that way. Okay, now this is the cathode, the oxidation anode side, okay? where the Cl minus is, re is, is oxidized into Cl2 gas. Okay, the net equation here, we have everything in it, including the sodium part. Look at it. When we have the sodium chloride, okay, that is plus, that is minus. In the presence of water, the sodium hydroxide is formed, okay, the hydrogen is formed, and the chlorine gas is formed. That is the net equation that happens in the chlor alkali industry. Let's look at the types of cells that are used. Like I said, we use electrolysis to produce chlorine, okay? And we make use of cells because we need an electro, we need an, a, 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 a chemical cell, we need an, a, 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 an electrolytic cell to produce chlorine. Now let's look at these types of the electrolytic cells that are used. 
In an electrolytic cell, remember that this is a cell that converts uh, electrical energy into chemical energy. Okay. We have got basically three cells that are used, three electrolytic cells that are used in the production of chlorine. One, we have got the mercury cell. Mm, by the mention of mercury already, I have, I have a problem with that. Okay. We have the diaphragm cell. We also have the membrane cell. Now, what happens with the mercury cell? The mercury cell, the, the advantage is that we produce very pure chlorine uh, in, in, in that process, pure, pure chlorine. And in the process, we've got an, an amalgam, okay, just the mixture of, 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 of mercury and sodium that is formed. But in the process, the sodium in that amalgam reacts with water to form sodium hydroxide. But then, what happens then to mercury? Mercury remains, and we know it is, it's a carcinogen, and it is poisonous. That's why I said, mm, immediately, I see that mercury uh, began to have some problem because of the environmental impacts that that has. Okay, diaphragm cell. Okay, the diaphragm cell, it's a cell that, pe that is permeable to ions but not gases. So it doesn't allow, when Cl2 is formed, remember what another gas that is formed is hydrogen. It doesn't allow the two gases to, to mix up. So it separates the two gases. And then it makes life easier because we don't want hydrochloric acid to be forming as well or hydrogen chloride gas to be forming as well. Okay, so those two gases are separated. It only allows the ions. So what are the ions there? We know we have got the Na plus, we have got the Cl minus ions, we have got the OH minus ions. These are the ions that are allowed to be moving around. But then, look at it. The diaphragm is made of asbestos, okay? So this diaphragm is made of asbestos, and now we know that asbestos is harmful to, to people. It causes what we call asbestosis, which is a condition where the, the, the respiratory system is affected by inhaling the asbestos particles. And this is a problem. And uh, that is why the diaphragm cell is also not environmentally friendly. It causes problems to human health. And for them to sort out the problem here, they, they, they replaced the asbestos uh, 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 material in the diaphragm by the synthetic polymeric fibers which are more friendly okay so that can be used and replaced by replacing that asbestos with the polymeric fibers synthesized ones the last type of cell used in the production of chlorine which is very much uh, environmental friendly is the membrane cell the membrane cell is friendly to the environment and what does it do it only allows cations to pass through the the membrane. So only the Na plus is allowed to pass through there. Uh, when it passes through there, it gets into the section where it can react with water to give us our sodium hydroxide. So that is the, the thing about the membrane, this, the membrane cell. And this is the one that is more user friendly because it is uh, not harmful to the environment. Okay, now let's move on to example four and see how some of the questions can be asked in the exam. So let's do some practice. Example four. Okay, the production of chlorine in industry is done through the electrolysis of highly concentrated or molten sodium chloride. One other product formed during the process is sodium hydroxide. The sodium chloride is oxidized while water is reduced. Okay. What is the highly concentrated or molten sodium chloride called? We call it brine. Okay. I think we have just uh, uh, spoken about the brine just earlier on in the lesson. Okay. It's called brine. 
write down the oxidation and reduction half reactions that occur. Right. Now, can you remember the oxidation and the reduction reactions that occur there? All right. What we know is that with the oxidation, we start with Cl minus ions. And we should end with chlorine gas and two electrons given up or lost. And to balance this, we need to put a two there. And this is the oxidation half reaction. Okay, that's the oxidation half reaction. Right, but then remember that the Cl minus ions are from the NaCl. So you can actually write it in this way as well. You can say that the NaCl there is going to give us that during the oxidation. Another thing that is formed, of course, will be the 2Na plus plus the two electrons. This is still the oxidation part. Okay? So writing down the reduction part. Remember, the reduction part is when the water gain water molecules, gain electrons from, from the, 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 the chloride ions to form we know it's going to form hydrogen plus OH minus ions. Okay? Now, ch let's check if this is balanced. We have got uh, two. We've got three there. We've got okay, so uh, we would have to make it four. So we put a two there, and we'll put a two here. So four hydrogens four hydrogens, two oxygens, two oxygens. So we find. So that, that, that's the, now the what? The reduction side. So reduction, half reaction happened there, or that is how it happens in that particular uh, cell. Right, let's move on to part three of this equation where we're going to look at how do we arrive at the net equation. Now here, I've already made some marks here. You would see from the, your oxidation half reaction, here I'm just giving you the iron, the Cl minus iron, and how it oxidizes, how it is uh, oxidized into Cl2 by giving away those two electrons. But in actual fact, it comes from the sodium there. So if we write it down here, including the spectator ions, if you like, of sodium plus, we'll have 2NaCl giving us Cl2 plus 2Na plus there, and then we have those two electrons there. Okay, because why are we doing that? We want to show how the sodium hydroxide is formed as one of the products at the end. And we can only do that when we go down to write the net equation for this uh, oxidation reduction process. Now, from here, you can see that I've got two electrons here, okay, with the water molecule here on the left, and I've got two electrons over there on the right with the oxidation of the NaCl, okay? Now, when that has happened, the two electrons, obvious, I mean, the, the, the equal numbers of electrons on either side of the equations can actually cancel out. And then you have got the Cl2, which is there, and you've got the Na plus there, okay? And then down here, you've got your 2OH, you also have your hydrogen. There isn't any common and there isn't any other common thing that I can look at and cancel out except for the electrons. Now, writing that down as my net equation, it means I will then have these as 2A, I mean 2NaCl plus 2H2O. Everything on the left side of these equations here. I've got the NaCl and I've got the H2O. This gives me, okay, this gives me Cl2 on the right, okay, plus 
I've got the hydrogen here, plus up there I've got the Na plus ion, so it's 2 Na plus plus what else do I have at the bottom here? I've got the OH minus, 2 OH minus. Now, when we write this net equation, we are able to see how the sodium hydroxide is formed because when you complete it by showing that you've got these here, okay, you would see that that is going to give you your sodium hydroxide. So you've got the Cl2 there, plus the hydrogen gas there, plus this obviously then gives you the sodium hydroxide, like I've said. So that is your net equation for that oxidation reduction process. So in a nutshell, that is how the chemical industry or chemical system in physical sciences grade 12 is like that is the content that you need to know that is the things that you should practice on to prepare yourself for the exam i hope you've enjoyed this lesson and i believe that you're going to do more practice in order to get yourself ready for the ex uh, for the exam and from me to nico kosa i wish you well have a nice uh, day and don't forget to practice thank you so much